Okay. We're live. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of the Boston Public School Superintendent Search Committee. Uh, I'm co-chair Pam Edinger, and because this is a remote session, um, I'm gonna ask Ms. Sullivan to, in a minute, uh, do the roll call. I would like to uh, let everyone know that um, our, our student member, um, Marcus, um, is actually today attending a Harvard Emerging Leaders program, so he will not be with us, but congratulations to him uh, for, for, for um, being admitted to such a, a, wonderful, a wonderful group. Um, and Jessica Tang, uh, Ms. Tang is actually in a BTU um, session tonight and she will not be with us. So um, Liz, would you go ahead and call the roll? Sure. Ms. Harvey? Present. Thank you. Mr. O'Neill? Present. Dr. Pignato? Present. Mr. Roundtree? Present. Ms. Tang is absent. Mr. Valenzuela? Present. Dr. Edinger? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Present. And Mr. McNeil is absent. So we have seven members present. Yes, thank you very much. Um, tonight's session is being shared live on Zoom and it will be rebroadcast on Boston City TV and posted on the search committee's webpage, bostonpublicschools.org slash soup dash search. The committee is pleased to be offering live simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, Portuguese, Haitian Creole, Cabo Verdeum, Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, Somali, French, and American Sign Language. After the interpreters finish introducing themselves and providing Zoom instructions, we will activate the interpretation icon or the globe at the bottom of your screen. So click the icon to select your language preference. Uh, we will start with our Cantonese interpreter. Please introduce yourselves and give instructions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. My name is Anna. I'll be a Cantonese interpreter for a meeting tonight. I'm Anna. 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 Uh, our next interpreter is our Mandarin interpreter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, everyone. My name is Terry. I'll be your Mandarin interpreter. Uh,大家好，我叫Terry，我是你们的国语翻译。待会呢，你在屏幕下方会看到一个地球的图标。呃，你点一下地球的图标，然后再选择Mandarin，你就可以听到国语的频道了。如果你是用手机或者是平板电
c'est un réel plaisir pour moi là avec nous à soin pour interpréter pour nous-mêmes en créole haïtien. Uh, merci uh, parce que vous choisissez la soin. Si nous avons une question, pas oublier de taper dans le chat là, et aussi um, choisir um, créole haïtien uh, global. Là, et puis, bonne écoute. Merci. Thank you very much. And our Somali interpreter, please. Good evening. My name is Camila. I'm the Somali interpreter. Mais je suis Camila Kusodwal Ao Shirkena, au nom de la Yantan ou Lugu Hulanae, Mamula Subu School Kaposton, ou Hadi Hele San Channel Kasomaliga, Alkas and Skadigisen. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our Arabic interpreter, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Ahmed Arubai. I will be your Arabic interpreter today. Marhaban, and I am Ismi Ahmed Arubai, and I am a Tarjima Lugal Arabia Liadelium. بإمكانكم استماع الترجمة باللغة العربية من خلال الذهاب إلى أسفل الشاشة ستشاهدون علامة الكرة الأرضية أضغط على هذه العلامة وستظهر لك اختيارات اللغات قم باختيار اللغة العربية وعندها ستمكن من الاستماع إلى الترجمة كاملة شكرا جزيلا Thank you Thank you very much And our American Sign Language interpreters tonight are Libby Ann Mayola and Michelle Martinez Thank you very much for your help um, we will now activate the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen. I would like to remind everyone to speak at a slower pace to help our interpreters tonight. Okay, our next item on the agenda will be the approval of meeting minutes. Um, we will be um, approving the minutes of March 29, 2022. Uh, I will entertain a motion. So moved. In a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objections to the motion, please? If not, Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Pignato? Yes. Mr. Roundtree? Yes. Ms. Tang, Mr. Valenzuela? Yes. Dr. Edinger? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Mr. McNeil is absent. Thank you. The minutes are approved unanimously. Thank you very much. Our next item, public comments, will take us to 6 o'clock, and that would allow for 15 minutes. Um, the, the committee has set aside up to 15 minutes tonight uh, for public comments. I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Sullivan to conduct it. Thank you, Dr. Edinger. The public comment period for today's meeting, um, as the chair just said, will be 15 minutes in total. Each person will have two minutes to speak, and I'll remind you when you have 30 seconds remaining. Those who interpret, who, excuse me, those who require interpretation services will receive an additional two minutes. Please click the raise hand button if you wish to speak. I will call on speakers in the order in which hands are raised. When I call your name, please state your name affiliation, and what neighborhood you are from before you begin. Our first speaker this evening will be Dr. Pignato, who will be reading a statement on behalf of the Opportunity and Achievement Gaps Task Force. Thank you very much, Liz. So these are the recommendations for the superintendent job description and energy guides. The Opportunity and Achievement Gap Task Force held its regularly scheduled meeting on Tuesday, March 29th, 2022. At that meeting, the task force agreed on the most important statement to include in the superintendent's job description currently in development. It should state, the top priority of the superintendent is to eliminate the opportunity and achievement gaps facing students of color, English language learners, students with disabilities, and students with, with low social economic status. Therefore, the number one goal of the Boston superintendent is to fully implement the 2016 Opportunity and Achievement Gaps Task Force policy, voted and approved by the Boston School Committee and to assign appropriate funding to achieve the goals of the policy. A required question to include in the interview guide should read, how will you go about implementing the 26 Opportunity and Achievement Gaps policy voted and approved by the Boston School Committee 
And what do you see as the role of the Office of Opportunity Gaps? And that's the closing of it. Thank you. Our next speaker will be John Mudd, followed by Roseanne Tong. Good evening. My name is John Mudd. I'm a, a resident of Bridge and a longtime education advocate in Boston and a member of the ELL Task Force. Uh, the last draft uh, I've seen is a very strong job description, but there was still a glaring omission. There is still no explicit mention of access to native language or native language literacy in the document. I thought I understood that access to native language was the policy of the school committee. It is a top priority of the district and its plans for multilingual learners. Learn. If access to native language is the policy, it should be stated explicitly as one of the challenges facing the Boston public schools. Access to native language and native language literacy is also a priority of the ELL task force for the new superintendent and its written recommendations to you, signed by school committee member Rafaela Polanco Garcia and Suzanne Lee. It was also emphasized in listening session testimony. Please, it needs to be included in the job description. It affects too many students who have been failed by BPS for too long. 31% of BPS students are multilingual learners and one third of special education students are multilingual learners. Simply saying, as you do in the draft, quote, successfully educating a high proportion of multilingual learners with diverse native languages is not enough. That does not say we need to shift from a state mandated system of English immersion under question two to access to native language under lookup. It should also say, including a system wide shift from English immersion to bilingual education, providing access to native language. 20 seconds. Simply adding multilingual, learn multilingual learners with disabilities to the list of marginalized groups is not enough. These 4,000 students deserve to be highlighted in their own bullet like developing and implementing plans with access to native language for multilingual learners with disabilities. I repeat, please add this kind of language to the job description. The students need it, and any candidates for the superintendent job need to know that this is your expectation of them. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Mr. Mudd. Our next speaker is Roseanne Tung, and I'll invite others who wish to speak to please raise your hand virtually. Ms. Tung? I'm a member of the English Learner Task Force. At Saturday's listening session, I, along with others, made the case that the new superintendent should have a track record of success in educating multilingual learners. However, the job description made me feel the need to comment again. I spoke from a personal point of view Saturday, and today I'm going to focus on the research. Miren Uriarte and I led one study in which we showed former English learners outperform native English speakers. In another, through case studies, we found that in schools doing well by English learners, principals are bilingual and bicultural and greater proportions of teachers are too. I also studied what parents of English learners want and found that while they value English fluency, they also want to maintain heritage language and the important tie to their cultural identity that it represents. However, SEI is a subtractive model. The goal is exclusively English language acquisition. Many students ultimately attain English while losing their native language. Scientists and psychologists have shown that being bilingual confers learning advantages like processing complex information more efficiently and better dealing with ambiguity. But the benefits are not only cognitive. Children who speak more than one language and understand more than one culture possess a priceless asset that will be increasingly valuable both to them and to our society. Depriving our future leaders of one half of their identity and skills is the wrong approach. One researcher says, quote, the issue of heritage language disappearance in the US continues to elude public consciousness and concern, 
although this language loss across generations is, in my opinion, one of the most fundamental erosions of a natural resource in this country. The Look Act passed in 2017, yet BPS has not made use of the provisions to reintroduce native language literacy programs in its schools. The lack of widely available educational options that make use of students' first language and fosters bilingualism is an educational and cultural injustice. Please prioritize a track record of implementing native language literacy programs in the qualifications of the next superintendent. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tung. Anyone else wishes to speak? Please raise your hand virtually. Dr. Edinger, I'm not seeing any other hands. Okay, thank you. Um, we can we can proceed then to the next portion of our agenda. Um, and this piece is um, the search process update. It's it's basically our weekly housekeeping um, in terms of what we've done and and what are intended next in terms of um, listening sessions. So bear with me as I um, recall some of these um, these facts. So we have held um, remote sessions on March 9th the 15th and the 24th. And we had more than 1300 folks register and more than 770 um, across, um, um, across the four sessions. I'm sorry, we held the last, we should be, we held four sessions and the last session was held on Saturday, April 2nd. And we had then about 1300 folks sign up to register and about 770 um, attendees across the four sessions. And the last session was um, hosted by um, Boston City Councilor Julia Mejia and Dr. Pignato. Um, we, we thank you for co-hosting for us. Um, additional sessions in collaboration with community groups is being um, put together. Uh, I, we know that our search committee members as well as our, um, our audiences and our public are eager to hear directly from communities and community-based organizations and to create more opportunities for native language dialogue. So we continue to explore with staff just what that will look like and to begin setting those up. Um, members will be invited to listen in um, and, um, and to um, take notes um, as their schedules allow. Uh, we know that everyone has a, a full schedule, um, but this is really important. And I think all of us would like to uh, be able to participate and listen um, and, and provide that input back into the, into the search committee. Um, there are other formats for engagement, as I noted um, last week, the video format um, is, uh, is being accepted. And there's also an online survey. In terms of the online survey, as of noon today, we've received 464 responses and the survey will close on April 15, after which we'll process the information um, and, and make a presentation to the committee on, um, on the various um, pieces that we've collected. Um, and using the feedback, we are in the process of collecting and synthesizing all of the feedback and looking for themes. And as you can see from um, our next piece of work on the job description, uh, much of the input is reflected there. Um, and that includes some of the comments that we heard earlier um, in the public um, in, in public comments today. So we ask um, our participant today to, um, to take a look with us as we go through the job description. Uh, we believe that we have reflected some of the, um, some of the priorities and the concerns. Um, and I know that we're collecting, um, we, we're collecting more input even as we go into finalizing the job description and as we go into um, thinking about formulating the questions, what we're collecting now will continue to inform both the search process, the interview process, and, and I think what is going to be key is that that information will be available both to the school committee as well as to the next superintendent. Um, in, in, in informing their planning, their decision-making and the way that they, um, they would want to um, 
shaped their early days. Uh, so, so, so we're hoping to, um, to consolidate and continue to listen um, throughout this process. Um, the next piece of information I have for you, is there any question um, about that, about the housekeeping portions? Okay, so you can always- I have a question. Oh, go ahead, Roxy. Thank you. Um, I know you, you talked about the surveys would be available, summarized version of them, um, yes. April 15th. As far as the videos and the texts, yep. um, are those gonna be summarized separately from the surveys so that there's also a summary of that information or that feedback, I should say? So, so, so we might, you know, we might want to ask um, our experts um, and, and our staff to think about what is the best way to consolidate that information for us, um, because it would, we would probably want to be able to gauge the volume of comments in each one of the topics that may come up, right? So we get a sense of scale, um, and I'm hoping that maybe the the videos and the um, um, and the comments in the surveys would be available as well, rather than just washing it out as a, um, uh, processing it out as, as, as numbers and data, right? So there's some specificity. We have not gone into those pieces too much in talking about it. So if you have suggestions for us, Roxy, as to how you would like to see it, that would be useful for you, that would be helpful for us to hear. Sure, so for example, I mean, even with the letters that, or the correspondences that came in through the email, I'm able yes. to read all of those individually. And yes. technically someone could pull points out. And I'm not going with the quantity because I've seen meetings where people tell a group, okay, everybody write this. And so you can get a quantity yes. and it not mean anything per se. Right. So I'm not even yes. going with like the, the weight of, oh, these numbers are more, but yes. more of just getting perspective and hearing different okay. voices. So if we could have access, because right now I have access to the, the communication, the letters, but even if we could see the videos and the texts so that we know what's coming in and can get that, that input to okay. go, that'd be helpful. Thank you, thank you for that. And um, as we, um, as the school committee engages the search firm, we would also want to see how much they can help us, right, with some of that consolidation, because this is a hours of work um, and we want to do it in a way that's helpful. Right, to all the constituencies down the line. So thank you for that. Uh, we'll keep an eye on, um, on that and, and, and try to work out the process. Right. Okay, so um, let me call back up my document here. Um, we, we have now um, completed the RFP process. And as what I've been told, and let me get my notes here, we have received seven responses to the search from RFP. And thank you to the RFP evaluation committee members um, our Chief Human Capital Officer, Al Taylor, Mr. Michael O'Neill, who's with us tonight, and Jose uh, and Mr. Jose Valenzuela with us tonight. And also with the help of BPS staff members, uh, Navreen Reddy and Mary Dillman, um, who supported this process. Um, we, we have um, a result. Um, we have a result of the, we, the, the comprehensive analysis of the proposals. The evaluation committee finds that one fourth consulting LLC slash JG Consulting offers a highly advantageous solution that would meet the Boston Public Schools needs. And Mr. Valenzuela has volunteered to share more information with us about the review process. Jose? Yes. Hi, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, as you stated, um, uh, Albert Taylor and Michael O'Neill and myself were on the evaluation committee. Um, reviewing the RFPs, we had some help from Naveen Reddy, who's the business manager um, as well. Um, we um, first started, so just to review the timeline, the RFP was released in February 23rd. Um, there was an addendum made in March 18th to allow um, proposals to be submitted um, to the deadline March 22nd. Um, we did a, a review, a technical review of the proposals uh, over two meetings, March 24th, March 25th. Um, from that point, we determined that we wanted to conduct interviews for the most highly advantageous proposals, uh, which we did over two days, three interviews, um, two on March 29th and one on March 30th. Um, and we finalized that technical review um, 
we looked at the pricing proposals at that point, so we didn't look at them until the end. Um, and on the 31st, we made our um, recommendation, um, as you stated, uh, one fourth consulting, uh, JG Consulting as the full name of the um, firm. Um, in terms of the evaluation, uh, we were looking um, at ranking um, different criteria. So we looked at the uh, proposal quality, um, you know, if it was like well written, um, was it clear and concise? Was it organized and easy to navigate? Did it provide a complete response to the RFP? Um, and any relevant examples of past successes? Um, we looked at um, ranking the proposals uh, in terms of the response to the scope of work. Um, you know, did it have a, a clear plan laid out uh, to complete the process? Um, did it uh, provide a clear description of what was going to be delivered? Um, you know, was it a comprehensive timeline? Um, and we also looked at um, the organization profile um, and, and ranked uh, on that criteria, you know, you know, who was uh, the members of the team that would be working with us, um, you know, looking at the references made to past projects and um, whether or not they sort of have handled searches for superintendents of schools for comparably sized uh, urban school districts. Um, and then finally, we also looked at their diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. So we really were focused in on the ways in which they discussed DEI throughout the application and had demonstrated sort of a commitment to DEI throughout. Um, and so based on all that, you know, we had determined um, uh, that there were three um, of the seven who were highly advantageous, met the criteria for an, in an interview. Um, and after, you know, looking at um, the proposals and discussing um, post interview um, with the rest of the committees, we made our recommendation about one fourth consulting, uh, JG consulting. We thought they kind of met um, and exceeded our objectives. Um, uh, and, and I think, you know, I'll speak for myself, but I'm sure Mr. O'Neill could agree here that we feel really comfortable with the recommendation um, and that um, we have a, a search firm that's really um, going to make sure that um, these next few months we are finding candidates that are going to be um, uh, exactly what the public and, and what we as a committee are looking for in, in people. And hopefully we're finding uh, that our job is extremely difficult because we have so many great candidates. So um, I don't know if uh, there's more to cover here than what I've covered or if there's questions, but. Uh, yeah, we, we can we can open it up for questions and, 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 and comments, but I wanna remind folks that it is the school committee that votes on the RFP. And what we're doing um, is uh, making a recommendation to the school committee. Um, so, so I wanted to, for that to be clear uh, for our committee members. So I will open this up and questions for Jose or about the process. Roxy has her hand up. Roxy. Um, I was, you said that you didn't look at the, the bidding price or their cost until the end. I'm just curious that did that then factor in or was it basically J and G um, if you had not even looked at the cost of their comparison cost, they would have they were still they would still be selected number one irregardless of their price or did that impact the decision? Um, I, you know, I think others who are there can chime in as well, but I would say no in the sense that um, that price matters to uh, us in the sense that we are being good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars, of course. Um, but the, um, the proposal, the interview that they gave, um, I think regardless of price made us really confident that they were the right choice. Um, but I, I would say um, that, that at the end, the, the pricing that we saw um, was not the determining factor. Like it's a, it's a factor but not the determining factor. I think the preponderance of all the other factors included made us um, lean towards this, this recommendation. I think that's how I would say it. 
I don't, I don't know if others feel the same way. Okay. All right. If there are no other questions, then I do believe we have a recommendation for the school committee uh, for tomorrow's meeting. Thank you very much um, for your good work, Jose and Michael. And um, please give our um, thanks when you see him to, um, to Al. All right, so let's- um, Dr. Adinger, uh, may I just say one thing? We also wanna thank um, Naveen Reddy, the uh, BPS public uh, business manager, who kept us very much on track and very focused on, this was an RFP, which had not been done previously in this process. So that is a, actually a very formal legal process on how it must be done, how it must be submitted, how it must be reviewed, how it must be rated. And, um, uh, Naveen was outstanding in keeping um, Mr. Taylor, uh, Mr. Venez, uh, Valenz, uh, Valenzuela, I apologize, and myself uh, very much on track. Um, and I just wanted to second uh, the expression that um, all three of us had unanimously agreed um, after a lot of discussion and pros and cons uh, among um, two present, presenting firms in particular, we had all unanimously agreed on JG. And in answer to Ms. Harvey's question, the financial proposal, which we then reviewed, validated the decision, um, but it was not the deciding factor. Thank you, Michael. And, and we will note for the minutes, uh, the wonderful contribution um, of Navreen and um, Thank you for your good work. Um, I'm glad that it was unanimous. Um, I'm glad that um, we have a firm that we can proceed with uh, once the school committee votes on this. All right, any other comments before I move on to the, um, to the job description? Okay, if not, then I'm gonna ask, um, is it Annie who's helping us with the, with the screen sharing today? I think it is, right? Liz? Yes, she's pulling it up now. Oh, okay, terrific. So, so this is our main focus for the evening, uh, which is updating the description. I know that um, a number of you have, um, have sent in um, changes that, and, and, and edits that you wanted to make, and, and hopefully um, those either in, 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 in verbatim or in spirit um, or in substance have been included. We ask to watch tonight as we go through it. Um, and we're hoping that um, as we go through the document in some detail uh, that we will come close uh, to, um, to a document that we can all live with. Um, the hope is that we will get that done in the next 20 minutes or so. Here we go. I can't see screen, oh, there it is. Okay, screen sharing. All right, so what I will do um, is to go slowly um, because I'm mindful that this is, a, this is a lot of material, though I think all of our committee members are, are pretty familiar with the setup. So the document starts with the preamble, um, which is the first four or five paragraphs. Um, the, the, the preamble ticks us through a couple of key concepts, right? So the first paragraph really talks about the embracing of an anti of anti racism as an organizational imperative, and as you see in blue line there, that has been added in in addition to equity, coherence, and innovation. Um, the 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 paragraph also addresses one of the key points that um, folks wanted to add, which is the uh, el elimination of the opportunity and achievement gaps um, at our schools. The, the, second, um, the second paragraph really picks up the idea of uh, the opportunity and, and, and achievement gaps and the policy that was passed and how um, in hewing to that policy is going to be important um, to the characteristics of the new superintendent. Um, and as you see at the end of that paragraph, um, we've added the um, uh, the repeating theme of anti-racism as one of the anchors um, of this work. And we proceed to the third paragraph where it talks about um, the, well, hang on, I lost it. Hang on, the 
there you go. Um, uh, the third paragraph um, talks about the, um, the ability of the superintendent to um, build the organization and to build and retain talent. Um, and it also talks a great deal about um, family engagement um, as, a, as a key concept. And then the last paragraph is a long one. Um, the overarching theme of this paragraph is really about community and political relationship building um, and, in, and, and using those tools in order to implement systems change um, and to um, be student-centered. That's towards the end of the paragraph and to um, be able to carry on in a district and, and to grow a district that is contemporary and digitally based in terms of, um, in terms of um, empowering the district to move towards a, a 21st century uh, global economy. Um, so that's, that's the, uh, the last piece of the preamble. And the last piece is a small one, uh, which is to uh, describe the work of the superintendent um, with the mayorally appointed school committee, being a member of the mayor's cabinet and building bridges with all the stakeholders and the entire school committee during a time of transition. Um, so so that, is the, um, that is the framing preamble of our document. Um, let me pause there for a minute. It's a, it's a couple of long five paragraphs. Um, and I think a number of you have sent in changes um, that that actually made this, this particular part much fuller um, and much more um, articulate. So thank you for that. I can't see you. So if you want to say things, you kind of have to unmute and holler at me. Um, okay, so not hearing anything at this point, we can always come back to it. Let's go to the qualifications, uh, which is, uh, here we go. Um, this illustrates uh, the qualifications, and um, there's a preference for experience, uh, being an experience, experienced superintendent in a comparable size and complexity district, the familiarity with New England and with Boston, which is something that we've heard over and over again, um, that we would prefer someone who is multilingual and culturally competent. Um, and that the ability to develop policies and strategic plans and to relate the student's learning experience to these initiatives um, that are being rolled out as being part of the key. Okay, so it is separated into required experience and preferred experience. Okay. All right, so the next portion of our job description um, is in five parts, well, hang on. Yes, it's in five parts. And as you look at it, the five parts are- um, Susie, um, yes, go ahead. And before we go on, just um, scroll, I'm sorry, Ann, may you scroll? Yes, a right there, <laughs> thank you. So I just want to understand a little bit better because- Okay, go ahead. The, where it says experience, because I know previously, it talked about the five plus years, which, you know, it was discussed previously, someone was hired that didn't have that, and that was on the job description before. I'm curious about, because oh, as I read this, when I, the 10 plus years related to providing experience mm -hmm. versus experience leading in a public school state of government, I would think that it'd be important to have that experience some amount, because when I hear experience or I see experience, I'm trying to understand, does that mean, okay, experience, I had one day or, you know, maybe, <laughs> You know what I mean? It's right. like I do, versus but... like some like they spent some time leading, uh, whether right. a public school or public or nonprofit, something of that similar size and complexity. Because right. I think that's the key component of having that type of experience. And I don't necessarily think I, I don't think it has to be five years, but I think just like we don't want someone that hops in for six months and has done it and then hops to the next position. So I just I'm, I would like discussion around like. If people really think there needs to be no years of experience around that. So, I so I think the next two bullets hopefully will frame the actually the next three bullets 
um, would actually frame what would be within those 10 years, right? So, so it is supervisory um, within the, uh, a, a P-12 district, a public P-12 district, right? And then leading in public school, state or local government. So I would imagine that those three bullets would, would sort of frame the 10 years because it needs to be related supervisory experience. Do, 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 do you want to do, do no no do, i understand what you're saying i didn't read it as that i saw them as separate bullets honestly like, oh okay, okay. that's six years in in a related field whether in education it could have been on the state level right it could have been on a related right. field on different ways and then okay. with i saw the, the pre-k 12 as separate yeah. um so within their 10 years so when we say experience we're not looking for someone who may have only done it for six months right. a year per se this is like within those right. 10 years we're not naming the amount of years, but the expectation right. is a significant amount. Would you frame it like that? Or, or you, you, add, you add the word comma, including, colon, and then indent the next three bullets. Then you have gotcha. everything in one piece. Then I would read it like that, yes. Thank you. Yeah, OK, <laughs> thank you. So, so can we go ahead and note that? I don't think that changes the content, but it does change the relationship, which I think might help. Would that be OK, Roxy? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, terrific. All right, so um, what was I? Oh, I was going to describe the next um, portion of this document it has five parts. And these are um, the skills that we wanna see in our superintendent, the, um, um, the which is the, um, hang on. Okay, so the skills, the skills piece has five different sections. The first section is tightly focused on opportunity and achievement gaps. And I know that this was of special um, passion and concern and interest um, because of the, um, of the policy um, that was passed that demands that we close these gaps. Um, and I'm hoping that what has been asked um, in this particular section where the superintendent um, candidate has to demonstrate um, these experiences and, um, and, and, and organizational um, acumen um, would, address, would address what we need. So underneath the gap and opportunity, um, uh, the closing of the opportunity and achievement gap piece, you will see um, a, a notation for English learners. You will see notation for students with disabilities. Um, you will see uh, the need for, um, to be an expert in policies and practices, um, cultural competencies, as well as a belief and, and practice in anti-racist, um, um, through the anti-racist framework or lens. So that's um, part one under skills and qualities. And then part two begins to focus in I'm really not trying to make it a long process. I just have a, a question about part one. Okay, will I say that again? I, I said I I'm, not, I'm not trying to make it a, lo a long process by each section, but. That, that's okay. I, I think it's Thank important um, because we want to get to as close as possible at the end of the discussion that we have a document that folks believe that they can hang on to and believe in and feel comfortable with. So, you know, stop me. Thank you. <laughs> Information. Because sometimes it's me, pro it's, it's myself processing the information. It's hard. So, yeah, go I ahead. also want, a, a, so in, here's a, first I'm going to frame it with a question so I can understand if it would make sense. So I, one, just multilingual learners and EL students with disability. EL students are multilingual learners. Was that just a, using a synonym versus, I think we're moving towards the language of um, calling our English learner students multilingual learners. So, well, Point two would be the multilingual learners, multilingual learners with disabilities would be the same language as multi learners. It's not like they suddenly became ELs because they have disabilities. Right. I, um, think, I think the EL was there because it had resonance with the work of the uh, with the work of the of the EL group. Um, and they have been so we're trying to align language. If it sounds duplicative, we can clean it up. Um, but but I think this has resonance with um, some of the comments that's come through. Um, and the only reason I ask is I, I mean I know I've seen talk, documents where the language to call the students multilingual learners is moving okay. forward. But I because I was also thinking about some of the feedback of like 
utilizing the with the look at and certain language. But it's like, so my question, so this is more of a question trying to get to understand of where things belong in, right? So in the yep. sense of a new superintendent coming in, is it more that what well, there's expectation they're following the, what's already been written in the district, meaning that we're moving toward, a, a, I guess we're intending to move away from SEI and there's plans in place. So just like the Gary order, we wouldn't have to list each of these things we're expecting them to comply with because there's an understanding of the way our dist the direction our district is moving in already. Is that why specific like acts yeah. wouldn't be in there? Am yeah. I understanding that correctly? From my understand from my understanding of it and following some of the changes, I think I think the it's important to echo some of the things that are being done in the district. Now, this is a section under skills. So we're looking for someone who has the skills in their background, right? Of having done this or something parallel to it or something similar. Um, the echoing of the language, I think, is 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 mostly to signal not only to the candidate, but to the uh, constituencies and the parents and the community um, that there is there is a convergence of right of skills coming in and work being done in the district. Um, if you if you if you have a proposal to, 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 if you think this is too clunky and, and you think that we need to clean it up, go ahead and write us a note. No, thank you. It, it helps. No, I'm just Does that help? see what should be in there. Cause I guess when you say skills, so it might align with another district is doing something else, but it yes. might be something yeah. that matches direction, that best right. practices, et cetera, but it could be called, it might be labeled differently. So that's why under yeah. skills yeah. is framed in that format. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. All right. So. Um, Keeping that in mind, the next section is that- I have a comment actually. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I understood this a little differently. Okay. Um, multilingual learners are, is the language that we're using instead of using EL students. Okay. So it should read multilingual learners and multilingual learners with disabilities because we have multilingual learners as an issue in itself and their performance and achievement. And okay. then those multilingual learners who also have uh, disabilities. Okay, so, so let me make a suggestion here that we can, uh, we can align either way. We just have to be, the, the, the search committee has to become sort of the translator when we ask these questions of the candidates. So, <laughs> so as long as we understood within ourselves that when we say multilingual learners, we mean EL students and multilingual learners with disabilities, we all, it, it is the same as EL students with disabilities. As long as we can make that translation in conversations with the candidates, I think it will be fine. Would that be acceptable to folks? Roxy, can, can you live with that? No, I think that's what I was saying that they're, they're not okay. different, multilingual learners with EL. So okay. the, yeah. So, so and, and I agree with you, Roxy. They are, they are no different. I think saying okay. EL student only does not acknowledge okay. the native language. It's as if we're replacing the native language, the identity, and saying okay. you're learning English. Okay. So as I said, I'm, I'm, I, once we make that change, I think what we need to do is become translators, right, for folks who are reading things differently so that we can bring, so that we can align the language. Um, of what we're using um, through all, all of the different documents. All right, so, so thank you for that input. We will, we will go ahead and, and, and get that amended. Um, should we move on to instructional leadership? Annie, can you advance the document? So part two is instructional leadership. And here are, um, th there weren't major changes in that, but to, um, to summarize for us, um, the points that are made in there really um, addresses um, the need for someone who understands urban education, um, a district that has multiple cultures and languages and multiple communities of color, um, and the importance of social and emotional learning, and the understanding of best practices um, that are in the field. And then here, I believe, is where we um, added language on bilingual education versus immersion. Lorena, isn't isn't this where where where, where some of that was um, was changed to reflect our desire? Correct. To um, move away we, from immersion. 
Yes, um, okay. we made a change in the third bullet um, as well as the fourth bullet yes. uh, to have it be strengthened and reflective in the and what we've heard and what we we know we're working towards as a district as it relates mm -hmm. to multilingualism and native language instruction. Thank you. Um, Okay, so um, let's advance to the, towards the end of number two. So we can, um, you can see there's an indented bullet there um, where um, some of the challenges that we wanted to highlight um, is under the last bullet. We wanted someone who has effectively addressed some of the specific types of academic challenges that are facing um, our public schools. Um, the, the, the learning loss recovering from COVID is one of those, and, and you can glance through. But in the fourth bullet um, is, um, uh, is what Lorena also referred to, was referring to on the bilingual education. Okay. Can I make a comment on those sub bullets? Yep, go ahead. Um, so, I mean, I might, I'm opinionating here, and I might be alone on this opinion, but I don't actually like learning loss as a phrase. Okay. To describe. I feel like it's a very deficit. Yes. Heavy kind of language to describe what happened to students in the last two years during COVID. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if maybe calling it healing and recovery yes. is really what we're aiming for. Um, and again, there might be people who feel like that's maybe not the way to address what they see as a kind of learning loss. Um, but I think there's all kinds of loss that students yep. are dealing with. And it's not just about whether or not they're at supposedly grade level um, because of the, you know, almost yeah. two years that they've been but, dealing with. But all kind, there's all kinds of loss. And I, I just, right. you know, I feel like yes, maybe, maybe healing and recovery could be a little bit better. And then the other point, um, the other bullet, and I, and I suppose the way I'm reading the changes to this bullet over the course of the like last couple of weeks is somewhat political. So I know I'm like walking on hot coals here, <laughs> but there's a bullet This is transforming practices and student outcomes for underperforming schools. And we took out language about state monitoring and turnaround status. And I feel like I know why, but I wonder if we can maybe push the language a little bit here in terms of, and so I was thinking of like, and be a strong advocate for district-led solutions. Oh, because, that's lovely. Because I, I, I really, <laughs> that's lovely. like, I, I know, I, again, I'm walking on hot coals here, but the idea that around, circling around us right now in this process is a threat, a threat of um, taking away our voice as a district to be able to create the solutions we think are best for our students. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that would include these schools that are labeled such. Then, if, then I would add, Jose, district-led and research-based solutions. Oh, that's lovely, I'm yes. I'm happy with that, yeah. But I, I, like, again, I was reading between the lines here about like why maybe taking the language out that was there previously might be, you know. So Stockton and Edinger, may I uh, propose in that sentence, it, it's um, transforming district-led and research-based practices and student outcomes for schools requiring focus targeted support and schools requiring broad core. Just take out the, you know, for underperforming schools because we define what underperforming schools are. And then and, and, yeah. also build in what Dr. Pinato said about transforming district-led and research-based practices. Will that work for Does folks? that put it all together? But I, <laughs> I, like, like, I actually like that. Go ahead. I, wanna, I, I, was gonna say, I like, oh, sorry. Did I interrupt someone? Because everyone went away because I was looking at the screen. <laughs> no, go ahead, Roxy. The other thing I wanted to add, because because you know, I, I have a, a strong pulse, but ac the academic loss, but I don't like learning loss. But with, when Jose was said that, I was thinking healing and academic recovery, because there's an academic component of it that yes. has to be specifically addressed. Okay. So 
that it's just not um, recovery in general. I think you need to have the academic component in there That's and the good. healing to address social emotional. And what Michael has just said, I like that stronger language to yeah. basically um, bring it home to the strength of strengthening up those schools basically that are labeled in that category. Okay. So, so we have a whole bunch of really great suggestions on the table. Is everybody okay with us um, taking those and making the changes within the section? I have two things, if that's okay, and they're quick. Yeah, go ahead. And I have a question after that. Go ahead. Okay. okay. If you can go up a little bit, I think it's under the achievement and opportunity gaps. The... Right before instruct the, the first one. One more. Yeah. Yes. So I'm reading this. That one. Yes. And I'm wondering what about the bullets guarantees the elimination of opportunity in achievement gaps. And if if there is an a specific one, can I synthesize the bullets and end up with yes, it guarantees that we are going to eliminate the opportunity and achievement gaps. So, so, so these are these are not necessarily all the strategies in, in the way that I'm reading this, right? It's mm -hmm. not necessarily all of the strategies, but you're looking for someone with the ability to carry out these type of activities or this type of reform that will move us towards opportunity and achievement gap elimination. So yeah, I know. So, yeah, that, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so we're not looking to move towards the elimination okay. of opportunity and achievement gap because it's okay. been decades. So do these read as after decades, this is it. We, we have this five bullets and there, there may be many, many more activities. Mm -hmm. do, do we synthesize that as a result of these priority bullets that the elimination of opportunity and gaps will be once so, and for all done? Right, so I would say that if you hire someone who is capable of, of, um, of meeting the standards that you've set in these five bullets, then you have, then you, then you, then you have the potential of carrying out the initiatives attached to these to eliminate the opportunities and achievement gaps. I'm, 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 trying, I'm trying in my mind to differentiate between the characteristics that you're looking at, looking for in a superintendent, mm -hmm. experience they may bring, um, and the and the strategic plan itself, right? I mean, it, it, you, they're, 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 in my mind at least, there are two different things. And I would suggest that if you have someone who can work, who can, if you have someone who understands, who has the personal characteristics of being anti-racist, have cultural competencies, and understands policies and practices, and understand the 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 populations of students that we are serving. Then you, then you, then you would um, have someone who would know how to move towards the execution of the strategic plans. But these items that you you have here are not the items of the strategic plan, right? These are the potentials for a candidate. Okay, I mean, I understand the way that you phrased it. Um, I yeah. did not necessarily see the guarantee from this bullets, but I, I can live with them. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I'm hoping that it would guarantee us a good candidate. Rather, I could, you know. <laughs> you want guarantee the job. Right, yeah. That will well, be done. You're a better candidate for the job. Um, yeah. But I know what you mean. I, I understand what you mean. But just the question is, does it send the message? So, and Dr. Pignato, tell me if I'm not hearing what you're saying correctly. But they, does this, do these bullet points send the message that any candidate that comes in, you must be prepared to eliminate it. It needs to occur. That is the job you're coming into to get rid of the opportunity achievement gap. So it's, so it's almost like, are you, are you saying, do we, in order to make sure the candidate knows, you must be able to come in and be able to do that. Do we need that synthesized bullet to say eliminate it? Right, what, what, right. Are these bullets, does it, does it hit home?
I don't know. So then I would push, ask the question, what would be the harm in adding, ex, um, I don't have the language, but you know, needs to eliminate, because basically all of this says you have to come in with the skill sets um, and the ability to eliminate the uh, achievement and opportunity gap in BPS, yeah. basically. Right. right? I mean, that's what, that, that, that's what the, um, that's what the category is, is calling for. Annie, if you would go up a little bit and, 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 and so these are the skills and qualities of a candidate that, uh, that the candidate must have. And those skills and qualities um, are, are being asked for in service to the elimination of opportunity and achievement gaps, right? It, it is, it, there's a translation here from the personal and professional characteristics of a candidate which can be proven because you're asking it to be proven through these bullets. If a candidate has these characteristics, then the likelihood of us being able to eliminate these gaps um, would be greater. But you know, no one can guarantee it. I mean, I I I worry about the word guarantee um, because I don't see how a candidate can come in and say, "I'm going to guarantee that I'm going to do this for you." I can say as a candidate, I have these characteristics. I've done it before. I'm bringing you my potential and I will come in and do this work, right? So, so I, I, I mm. can, can we just sort of sit with this one for a bit and, and see if the other pieces that are after it um, would, would support it? Okay. Okay, all right. And so, I, have, I have one minor one under, um, I think it's the fifth bullet under instructional leadership. Three, four, five. Wait, hang on. Evidence is a strong commitment. Yes. Um, is there something more measurable than saying a strong commitment? Because th this makes up the whole child, yeah, right? Strong, so do um, we want just a strong commitment to the whole child? Yeah, I see what you mean. What would you like? Um, Demonstrated effectiveness in? So proven this way, they would have to, yeah, proven you know, right. rather than commitment, right. so something that, that we can prove, that they can prove. How about proven effectiveness in leading um, programs that addresses the economic, socio, emotional, and physical development of the whole child? Does that work? I think so. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Um, let's let's move through instructional leadership, which we talked about, to number three, which is management and operations. Um, this section is basically um, the following bullets. Um, it talks about resource management. It talks about the ability to uh, deal with facilities and facilities master planning, being able to. Um, negotiate and work with um, unions and professional associations in a productive way. Um, it mentions funding and it also mentions high school redesign. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we, we heard all of those different um, operational and operational management um, areas being mentioned in our listening sessions. There weren't a whole lot of changes in this section um, that were made. Um, so can we, could you scroll up a bit or scroll so I can read the bottom? Oh, there we go. Nope. The other way. Yeah. I just want to make sure that we've, you know, captured, um, supporting, uh, the district and schools and effective operational systems, um, mm -hmm. to, to do some of the, to be responsive to the safety feedback that we got. Right, success in leading managerial and operational endeavors. Um, so, so we want to have something in here about, about managing and operating um, a safe environment, right? Is, is really what you're, what you're after. Yeah, that and in order to do that, you know, uh, schools and the district centrally will need to set up effective systems. And I think that we should say that explicitly. So eff effective systems that 
that results in, I'm just making this up, if you don't like it, say something, that result in a safe teaching and learning environment. How's that? Yeah, that, 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 uh, that works for me. Okay. And Dr. Ettinger, I just want to note that the ASL interpreters have asked that we just say our names because while uh, they're oh, spotlighted my. in the chat, they um, yes. can't see who's speaking. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Okay, Arlene so Pignato, I have one more. <laughs> oh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, so the last bullet, galvanizing okay. central office support and accountability for school leaders in a system of schools with differentiated autonomy. Uh-huh. Um, so and maybe you've captured it below. Um, I read it earlier today. So it's okay. not just the differentiated autonomy, it's also the different perf performance levels of schools. Carly, would you say that again for me so I can try to capture it for you? Um, yes. So we're having, um, we're supporting schools um, and we're holding them accountable based on the different levels of, of autonomy that they have. Based on different levels? But Yes, th this is how I'm, uh, I'm understanding that bullet. Of autonomy, uh -huh. and you want it to read differently? Um, yes, because it's not just the autonomy, right? It is how they are also performing. Okay, so, so, so let, let me read it back to you. What I have is galvanizing central office support and accountability for school leaders in a system of school with differentiated, with differentiated autonomy and performance levels? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was Pam Edinger speaking. My apologies. I didn't get to the interpreters that time. All right. So the if we may move on to the next section, I know we're running a little long, but we're almost there, folks. Um, the next section is family, is family and community engagement. And you see the first two bullets were added, they're in blue, and, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, let folks read that for a second. Um, so that is the guarantee of, well, the promise of authenticity. Um, and what I really liked is that second bullet that talks about establishing an engagement infrastructure for deliberation and decision-making. We're basically talking about a structure of good governance, um, even though I, I don't know if that's a word that is used in K-12 or not. Um, but when I hear engagement infrastructure, that's, that's what I hear. And then um, the, the other key point in here is seeking out traditionally marginalized voices um, in our communities, in our district, and therefore the, to better serve um, those students. Um, and then the last bullet is um, community-wide engagement that names basically all of the key stakeholders, right? Students, families, teachers, school leaders, staff, bargaining units, community advocates, foundations, partner organizations, media, elected officials, school committee, and the mayor. Um, so that section, um, how does that section sit with, with folks? Uh, do the two bullets that are added help? Thank you, Michelle. Okay. Um, like that, and Jeff, I may just say this um, and other pieces show that the, the feedback we have received from a number of groups has been really helpful. Um, yes. I think all of us saw the letter yesterday or so from 15 community groups that really succinctly laid out like five bullet points, um, you know, that we see it, we see it embedded now. So I just, and, and we received a, a number of groups have been um, giving feedback. So, and, and clearly, hopefully folks can see that it is in, uh, the feedback yeah. has been embedded in this because I thought they were really, really helpful. Yeah, I thought so too. Thank you, Michael, for mentioning that. I'm going to move us on to the last number, number five, professional culture. So um, there, there weren't a lot of changes in this, but I wanted to be able to um, uh, just say out loud what I believe is the summary. I think the most important piece here is to motivate everyone um, to innovation and gap closure. Um, that, is, that is echoed here um, very clearly. 
um, and the mentioning again of a collaborative culture and being able to guide uh, systemic improvements um, and to manage a large complex system um, that, that is repeated and, and it echoes what we had asked for earlier um, in terms of qualification. But I thought the one piece that really struck me um, so powerfully was that the, the requirement of courage um, and it's a, it's a bullet in the middle that says displays courage in decision-making that will always put the needs of students first, regardless of conflict and criticism, engages in regular and direct conversation and in dialogue with students and families. Um, I thought that was absolutely powerful. Um, so I, this, uh, go ahead. Sorry, um, this is um, Lorena speaking. I agree with you, Pam. I think that um, that for me encompasses a lot. I'm just wondering because especially in this section, there are so many different yeah. bullet points, if it would be a value to perhaps move that up just to like center and frame yeah. the rest of the, the pieces. Yeah, I was thinking either move it up or move it to the very last bullet so that it punctuates. I mean, either, I, I agree with you, we need to move it and either place is good with me. The last bullet reads, exhibits a proven track record in managing large systems, including the application of and use of current technology to improve efficiency and responsiveness. I mean, it's a good bullet, but it sort of ends on a technicality or, or it ends in a technical uh, competency rather than a moral and courageous one. So I'm, I'm I don't know, beginning, the end, how do folks feel? I like beginning because I think beginnings are pri as priorities when I'm reading documents. Okay. okay, that sounds good to me. Yeah, I agree. Cool, yeah, that's a very powerful statement. I really loved it. Mm -hmm. um, so the last piece on this document, Annie, um, are things that I don't understand. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the terms mean. All of you probably do. Um, the last paragraph is really important to me, um, and I think it may be standard language because it is our, it is our commitment um, to non-discrimination and fairness, and to me, moral centeredness. Um, so that is the concluding um, two paragraphs of the job description. So. Um, I want to thank all of you for 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 staying with us for for this long processing, but I, I thought it was important to go through it. Um, we have gathered the feedback um, that has um, that, that 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 you gave us over the last 30, 35, 40 minutes, and we have notes. So we come to and Annie, can you stop sharing for a minute so I can see people's faces? Thank you. Ah, there we go. All right, so we have um, a, a, a bit of a decision to make at this point. Um, with the changes that everybody proposed at the table um, during this process, I think we are likely 98%, if not 100% in there, right, as a job description. I also believe that it will likely need a little polishing and not polishing in content, not polishing in sentiments, but just to make sure that, that, that our sentences are parallel, you know, surface edit kind of stuff. Um, so my proposal, if, 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 if you would let me entertain it, is that um, we agree that we have consensus around the table and that it will need surface edits and we would ask the um, search firm, once they have been confirmed and selected by the school committee, to help us polish and publish. Um, and that we would recommend this document um, to the school committee um, for a vote. This, we can only make recommendations, we can't. I don't think we can vote on this. Are we, are we comfortable enough with the discussion that we've had with one another tonight um, to be able to go there? And we can continue to work with the search firm, right? To, to, to clean it up. It will not be the last time you see it. But it, with all the additions that we have to make, I think it's, it, it's, it will be a little rough until somebody does a polish. And I think the document with all the work that you put into it deserves that. So will folks entertain, can I, I, I would entertain a motion to, um, to, um, to resolve that we've reached consensus 
that the document is ready uh, to be presented to the school committee as a recommendation with the caveat that the search firm, once they are engaged, um, <laughs> I'm making this up as I go here, um, uh, once they're engaged, um, will help us polish it up so that it, it can be published officially. I will entertain that motion. So motioned. Thank you. Don't make me repeat it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the key thing is you said it will be a polishing, but not a changing, right? That was yeah, it's not changing. We will make all the changes that you've made today. I need a second before we can start talking about it, though. Can I have a second? Second. Okay. So yes, we thank you. So no, we will not be changing content, but I want to make sure that you know the language that that you've given us that we've incorporated will fit you know, stylistically into this. It will not be a change in content. And we'll continue to see it. It will not be the last time you see it. We just wanted to go ahead and run it through the school committee so that we can put a punctuation mark on it. All right, so all in favor? Oh, I think we need a roll call, Liz. We do, thank you. <laughs> I'm well-trained now, okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Pignato? Yes. Mr. Roundtree? Yes. Ms. Tang? Mr. Valenzuela? Yes. Dr. Edinger? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Thank you, Mr. McNeil. Thank you, it's unanimous. Thank you very much. I, I think I, uh, Jose says it might be helpful to hear what Lorena stated before we went live. Oh, I, what did you, oh, is, is this just um, a comment? Yes, this was one of the pieces that um, I was mentioning that typically the oh, search okay. firm um, will engage, and apologies if you hear some yelling, there's a tantrum happening in my house at the moment. <laughs> I'm gonna let you go. <laughs> this is Zoom TV people. Um, so Mommy. what I was saying is that, oh, that is you, that is you. Um, the search firm typically engages yep. in the community engagement process and it typically uh, does the job of creating the job description. But because we knew that we wanted to move this process along as quickly as possible, we got a head start on that. Um, and so with this, we are saving some time for the search firm so they can hit the ground running um, and they'll be able to, to engage. And then the other piece that I, was, that I did mention um, is that the way I see um, the feedback that we're receiving from community is that it doesn't end with the creation of the job description. It continues to inform what the interview questions will be. It continues to inform um, what we wanna prioritize in the, in, in the candidates. Um, and it will also continue to inform how the district can um, modify, evolve some of the pieces that are being raised and some of the challenges that we're seeing within our communities that um, can happen even before a new superintendent is um, engaged and also long-term thinking with school committee um, and, and district. Uh, leadership. So it, it's just an ongoing process. While very important for the job description, it's not a. It's not the only reason why we're engaging in, in this community input. Can you please No, not right now. Hey. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lorena. That is really helpful. I'm glad that. Uh, I'm glad that you recommended it, Jose. Okay, so I, I think um, we need to give folks their evenings back, and and this is a tremendous piece of work that y'all did tonight. Thank you so much. I know it's been a lot of hours and we'll try to keep to the hour the next time we're together, but this was really useful. So I'm very thankful. Um, okay, so let, I will entertain a motion to um, adjourn. Nobody wants to adjourn. Uh, so move. Thank you, Ms. Second. 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 Uh, and, and, and all in favor? You do need a quick roll call, Chair. A quick roll call, Liz, quick. Ms. Harvey. Yes. Mr. O'Neill. Yes, thank you all. Dr. Pignato. Yes. Mr. Roundtree. Yes. Mr. Valenzuela. Yes. Dr. Edinger. Yes, and thank you, everybody. Ms. Lopera. Yes, thank you. Thank you, we're adjourned. All right, thank good you. night, everybody. Good thank night. you. Bye. Bye.